Yeah, so we are recording. So, wow. This is a good way to start, isn't it? We've got everything set up. Um, Husey, first of all, mate, um, how are you keeping amidst all of this? Yeah, good. I mean, um, the big thing for, for me especially is trying to keep uh, a little bit of normality and try and have a routine. So kind of setting out things to do, even if it's just like two or th- three things to do in a day. Um, just keep my mind occupied, try and do some like garden workouts, walk the dog, spend time with the kids and my missing. But yeah, it's just like appreciating that time that we kind of have together um, and not dwelling on all the negative that's surrounding everything. That yeah, absolutely. Um, just on the basis of everybody else around you, are they keeping well? Are you keeping everybody's spirits up? Yeah, I think it's the main thing because like, with with what I try and do and, and with, um, with with the videos that I've been posting and, and what I've been sharing is, is kind of like trying to um, kind of rub off on other people in a positive way, do you know what I mean, by yeah. spreading that positivity because everybody, it's no secret what I've been through, it's no secret that um, I suffer quite badly and have done some, some things that, um, that have led me down the wrong path, but trying to trying to help other people now is is another way of helping myself as well in, in a weird way like by helping other people and knowing that i'm doing something positive is a way that um, makes me feel good about myself do you know what i mean so it's such it's it's um it's really good knowing that that the feedback that i get is is obviously helping people um but the main thing is obviously um letting people know that it's all right to feel how that they do because this this is a, a circumstance that we probably will never face again and um, it's it's important to know that anxiety is going to be probably normal it's a, it's a thing that we're all feeling it, there's a lot of uncertainties just like trying to make people realize that it's all right and i'm here to help kind of thing you know what i mean yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, so I haven't spoken to you about my kind of situation before, and I've been through similar things. I don't think uh, I don't think anybody can know whether something is as bad or as worse as somebody else's face because you can never understand what's going on through somebody's head and things like that. So, we it's, it's not about comparison and it's not about that sort of thing. It's about everybody faces their own different battles and things like that. And um, so, I'd I've actually found my anxiety has kind of been a little bit better, just in the sense that you know where people are and you know that they're keeping safe. So, for example, my grandparents are 82 and 83, respectively, and they're both staying at home. They're self-isolating. I've gone and dropped off some veg and potatoes to them and stuff like that just to keep them ticking over. And really, for me, it's about making sure they're okay and making sure everybody in my house is okay. You know, there's certain things that you can't control, um, and it's just about knowing what you can control and learning to deal with that. Um, So if you talk about the... um, kind of where it all started if we go before this whole epidemic started um yeah. as far as i know you were suffering quite badly back when the beloved yous were playing um manchester united and you were quite you were quite uh open about talking about the fact that a big game missing out on a big game like that really killed you and uh talk me through about what was going on at the time and your thoughts and feelings at that time yeah, I just think that um, there's always that one thing, isn't there, where the old cliche of the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think that the Man United game, as big as it was, um, and the injury that I sustained, although it wasn't like a major serious one, it did mean me missing the game at Old Trafford. For me, that was that straw because I never, um, I never took the time to actually realise what was actually going on in my life before that. So I was just kind of taking it a step at a time, um, kind of brushing things under the carpet, not dealing with it there and then. Um, and that kind of football was my escape. Cambridge United was, was somewhere that I could go and be myself and express how I was on the pitch um, and off the pitch by the way I spoke to the fans, the kids around the football club. And, and try and make people happy, make them laugh, because that's a characteristic that 
that I have. I've always had. Yeah, um, I, th- I think speaking and, to other people at the time. Sorry to interrupt you there, mate. I think speaking to other people yeah, at the time, it's a, it, that was a big characteristic. It was Hughesy. No matter what he's doing, no matter what's going on with himself, he'll always put 100 percent in on the pitch when he's available to. Even when you were carrying little niggles and stuff like that, you were still coming out on the pitch, putting 100 percent in. And the fans all loved you because of that as well. And because, technically, even though you come from Scunthorpe, is it, I believe? You come from Scunthorpe that way? Yeah. And um, so even though you came from Scunthorpe, you were very much used, born and bred kind of thing. Yeah, like grow, growing into that first team through the youth team and stuff, like, it's like a learning process because as a young player, you might be a little bit uh, raw, as the expression goes. I mean... Technically, I've developed over the years, obviously, and, and grew into the first team. But I wasn't the finished article by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I know that at the beginning of my career at Cambridge, I could have probably be somewhat frustrating to watch and, and stuff. But I'd always put on the shirt and the name on the back of my shirt never mattered to me. It was, I'm going to do anything for this football club and for the fans and and to, to do my best when I'm on that pitch and I think I've, I've probably broken and broken bones by throwing my way into I remember Newport away actually like we're winning 1-0 got like the 90th minute and I threw my body in the way of a ball I broke my wrist and it had to come off um, and then they equalised like in the last dying seconds but it's just like I don't know Any I think anyone who I played with over the years and um we're the same we had like a good group especially the promotion with inside when we got promoted uh, to League 2 I think any of them boys had the same characteristics and we needed that you know? and uh, it's like you say there it's it was a it was a good experience for me and think that, like I said before that like football was, was my escape from a lot of things that were going on off the pitch um, because of the injury and what had happened and me missing Old Trafford, I kind of missed what I was running away to. And then almost when you don't have anything to escape your mind and you have to be in the moment and live in the moment and take one step at a time without knowing how to, it becomes very difficult. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you talk about that side that you came up with, like likes of Tom Champion, Josh Coulson, Ian Miller... Richard Tate, all sorts of different people and fantastic people at that. Um, I remember last, I want to say, no, it would have been two summers ago now. So we're talking summer 2018, I think. I was sat with, I don't know, have you met um, Josh Coulson's friend, Nathan? Have you met his best mate, Nathan? Yeah, Yeah, Nathan Turner. So I sat with him, Nathan, a load of other people from Hardwick, if you know where Hardwick is. And um, yeah. we were all sat in the social club there watching England in the semi-final against Croatia, just casually having a chat with Josh Coulson over the fact that uh, England were beating Croatia, which was, yeah, which was very surreal at the time, obviously. And you, and you learn to realise that these people that you suppose watched, and I remember watching Josh's first goal against Plymouth in that first game back yeah. in League Two, and I, was sat, I was sat, stood in the Newmarket Road end, and it was absolutely amazing. I, it, it's one of those best footballing memories that I think will live with you for a lifetime. That, like, yeah, it's like you say there, it's like them feelings that we all look back on and them, them emotions that we can all kind of cherish and hold hold close to our hearts. And like, I, I experienced it um, as a player uh, and, and, and as a fan. I still follow Cambridge now and it holds a real real place in my heart and still try and keep in touch with Dusty and Coles and Tate and Bezar and, and, and all the, the lads there, you know. Uh, Dono champs. Um, it it might not be as often as like every day, but you know there'll be something on social media and we'll comment on each other's posts and it's just nice that you, we're all like still follow e- each other and and support each other and, and stuff. So and and on record when I came out with going through everything, the amount of support I got from my teammates as well. Um, like I say, Ian Miller, Josh, Ryan Donaldson, Tatey, Will Norris now um, playing for Ipswich, obviously. And he, these lads like looked out for me, do you know what I mean? And yeah. kind of said, listen, all right, you're feeling this way, which 
was a new experience for me because I was used to being that oh, I'd use as a clown and yeah, always yeah. messing about. You don't expect somebody a... with as much charisma, I suppose, as you to be high, to be kind of stuck behind this rock, as it were, stuck in this cave which you don't feel you can break out of. It's almost as if you feel you feel at times you're the Messiah, but you can't get you can't roll away the stone, kind of thing. I just think when I turned. When I turned up to United and I walked into the Abbey or whether it be on a training field or whatever, that a mass kind of went on. I was in choosy mode, um, as it was, and I'd always try and make people laugh, like joke around and stuff. I mean, there's a picture of me uh, with, when Richard Money was at the helm and we're doing like a full, and I mean full squad photo. So right from the kids... Up to the first team. That that under eights up to first team photo. Yeah, and there's a picture of an outtake picture of me at the back, just with my hands in the air, and um, it was like little things like that. It's like it's it's funny because like I just think I didn't take myself too seriously. I didn't take what I was doing seriously, but I crossed the line. That white line's gone the football picture, and I think I'd like to say anyway most people see how serious I took it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I found balance of being able to to kind of switch. But then it's funny because when you are doing that, it's almost like a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. You, you, you have those incredibly you know I mean? high highs and you, inc- and you have those completely dark low moments where you're sat by yourself and all sorts is running through your brain and you just kind of want it all to stop don't you and i think I, yeah. I, I, and i think that's the most difficult thing so if you don't mind when so you talk about putting this mask on what were what were the initial if you're happy to talk about it what are the, what were the initial triggers to the anxiety whilst you're at united so i i did um i had a Amazing time at United, um, and I think like uh, going back to the United game, that was really when. Um, however, before that, I was suffering with like anxiety um, before I get to training. So the the anxiety of actually going to um, to be around people um, before a match, like driving into a match day, and to try and steady the nerves if you like I was drinking yeah um, and that was going on for some time before I actually accepted that I had an issue yeah um, I was in a uh, a relationship with my ex partner it was real hostile um, and it was just that that kind of and obviously listen when I had a bad game as well I was my biggest critic so that obviously does no good for your anxiety and I'd read comments made by people on like forums and social media. I know, obviously, as a player, you're not meant to. Yeah, you're you're a big you're a big man on your Facebook even now across the Cambridge United supporters forum. So I can imagine if people were sticking it into you on those forums, you would read everything and take it quite personally. Yeah, I did, and, and I know it's not meant personally because everyone's entitled to an opinion. Exactly, they'll argue person. that they pay their ticket, they pay for the ticket, they're yeah. entitled. And, and the type of person I am. And the type of person, uh, the, the type of person that my brain works differently. So, if somebody said uh, said something that was a negative, then I ultimately, I straight away, I will believe that. Like I would start to think that about myself, and it's just a passing comment. And it might not be. It just might be in that moment. Or I know I had bad games. When I was at Cambridge. So I'm not that. But. Um, when I did have a bad game, I would then feel bad about myself, but then take to forums, social media, see all these negative comments. I'll be like, yeah, they're right. Yeah. yeah. And then I just, it was a little bit of self-confidence. I had real self-confidence issues. Um, and yeah, I just think that my anxiety, I was insomnia. So I struggled with insomnia. So I didn't sleep, I couldn't sleep. Um, and obviously, just turn to the wrong things to try and to try and get through it uh, without talking. What were those wrong things, if you don't mind me asking? Because we can we can probably find a yes. bit of parallels in between me and yourself. Maybe not necessarily with certain things, but go on. Yeah. So I was, especially when um, we 
was struggle. I was struggling personally. It was a lot, a lot of alcohol. I drank a lot of alcohol, um, and then kind of started when that was wearing off and wasn't really satisfying or, or fulfilling myself. Uh, and then the drugs that I, I experienced, um, drugs. So I was taking different drugs. Um, so I was asking for like diplophenyac, which is a muscle relaxant, zopiclones, diazepam. Um, obviously cocaine um, diazepam itself is a big one that's actually meant for people with bipolar and things like that so that's quite a big yeah. big thing to to just take as a recreational drug if you don't if you don't mind me saying that's quite yeah. a and, stark and, reality and yeah so and then obviously the the worst thing that i was probably a little bit hooked on was tramadol uh, and i was I was like sniffing tramadol. I was, I, I was in a real bad place with it, you know, because it was obviously a real strong pain relief. Uh, but it's an opiate, so it's very addictive. And yeah, well, I just think in that time I was in so much pain um, internally. Obviously, physical pain is different. Uh, however, there's not like a, there's obviously I was on sertraline as well. Um, yeah. Started off on the oxetine, uh, which wasn't working. Then I tried sertraline. I was actually on 150 milligrams a day of sertraline. Wow. Which is a top dosage. That's yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, like so. Myself, I'd only ever taken 30 milligrams of sertraline, I think, to start with, and then I got switched yeah. over now to uh, take 30 milligrams of citalopram a day. Uh, so oh, that okay. kind of just keeps me kind of level and things which which is good it helps me um you can definitely tell so if i have like mismanaged it or something like that um if i have forgotten to take it for maybe one or two days uh which which tends to be unfortunately a regular occurrence it's it's i, I find it quite difficult to as soon as you get up remember to take it and it's one of those things that you need to get your head around to sort um but you can definitely I'm tell there's a different difference no sorry to interrupt that's right i'll just say i think it's important for people to know that who are taking medication that that one day that you miss the effects can be really drastic yeah i mean they say obviously to wean yourself off it and if you are on the medication then you want it for a reason it's it's having a balance so your highs are not too high and your lows are not too low that's the whole reason yeah. <clears throat> uh, remember men mental illness and is a chem it is scientifically proven is a chemical imbalance yeah. in your brain. So all your uh, medication is doing is making sure your chemicals are balanced. Yeah. yeah. So the it, highs it's, it's not turning act, into a Superman. Yeah. So I act impulsively. I tend to act impulsively, or I will tend to. Uh, I have a, an addictive personality. So, so drugs, alcohol, anything. So like when I was younger, gambling, anything that I'll, I'll, I do. I'll be, I can become addicted to, you know, um, which is can be a positive, don't get me wrong, but it's, for me, more so than not was a negative, you know. So it's it's making sure that you, you're you aware of, of almost yourself because your subconscious is a very powerful, powerful thing. So if you develop, for instance, a habit, so a bad habit of taking drugs or drinking, that almost becomes your subconscious. So when you're sat down in your house, for example, or when I was sat down, personally to me, um, that was straight away drink. Yeah. When I was waking up in the morning, it was drink. Stop at the shop on the way to training, get a drink. You know, so that is like habit forming. Um, and obviously there's good and bad habits, but I was choosing the bad habits as opposed yeah. to spending my time and getting in the habit of going to the gym after the training or getting in the habit of doing the right things i was doing those things that were numbing what my brain was saying were you then did you find your supposed performance levels in training were affected by it all um yeah I, to be honest i think after the man united game it all went that's where my career then at cambridge started to deteriorate uh, not necessarily on the pitch. The I don't machine, think, Sorry, mate. I don't um. think, that's all right. I don't think that um, the performances as such on the pitch were. I could kind of not like, hide behind what 
what um, I was asked to do because really Richard Money was saying every goal kick, every set piece, aim for Husey, he'll flick it on and we'll play in their half. You know, so yeah. it's straightforward, really straightforward. And um, I think that um, I'll put weight on, not going to lie about it, can't hide it. Put weight on, which is obviously yeah. as you progress up the leagues, is a big factor. Yeah. Um, Always. Especially when you're doing it full time as well. Yeah, and um, I weren't sleeping, so that's obviously a big thing. Um, I wasn't staying after and doing gym sessions. Uh, my mind was elsewhere. And, Did you speak to anybody uh, at the time about it, or not really? Uh, yeah, so I spoke to Greg uh, and Dr. Bukhazy, who, who um, who's still there. Greg Reed. Um, Greg, yeah, good man. Saved my life then too, they did. And um, yeah, just... Kind of, they made me realise that listen, football if you're not in the right headspace is just a, it's just the game. It's obsolete, uh, really, isn't it? Life. There is more to life than, than football, and I love football, and um, it is a passion of mine. And whenever I go out on the pitch, at like I'll I'll throw my body on the line and put my body on the line for, for football. But um, it is just the game, and there is more to life than football. I had three children. Uh, two children at the time, sorry. Um, and yeah, it was really a case of, okay, now it's you, you've got two daughters that need you. So that's the important thing. Absolutely. So uh, again, it's kind of one of those ones which is difficult. It's, it's a delicate question. So as you were going through this all and uh, you had these various things with addiction and your relationship eventually broke down with your previous partner and things along those lines... Um, did you at any point struggle to see your children or things like that? Yeah, um, at the beginning it was real tough. Um, still going through court to this very day. Um, and I'm not the type of person to to real speak about, obviously, or ill of the mother of my children. And never would I ever, ever uh, disrespect her in that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Um, but I think that um, a lot of people, and I'm going to speak about the bigger picture now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in regard to this, uh, because I think a lot of people may be going through it, or some people may have experienced what I'm going through. So it's still obviously ongoing through the courts. And I think that when you have um, a reputation like I do, or a kind of history, should I say, that I do, regardless of what you then do in the future people will still try and use it. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Or it's hard to kind of forget. Or you're never going to forget. I'll, and I'll hold my hands up to that. I've made mistakes, don't get me wrong. But um, I just think that discrimination in mental health is one of the biggest things and leads to the statistics being so high in suicide and things like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it is, it's still difficult. They, they live five hours away from my house. So um, I see them as much in, as I physically can, which on average is every three weeks. So um, Is technology a big part in between that? Do you FaceTime, Skype regularly, that kind of thing? Yeah, we... Um, I, I get three FaceTime calls a week with my girls. Um, me and my partner, uh, she has two little girls as well, uh, which is nice. So, um, You're a father yeah, and a stepfather all in one now. Reg- yeah, I re- regular contact with Grace, Bella and Hope. And um, I think that the, they, the girls are one of the reasons I'm sat doing this video today. Um, if they weren't in the picture, I don't think I'd be here. Um, and that's the severity of where my head led me to. Um, and yeah, I don't think if I did, if I didn't have Grace and Bella at the time, I'd be sat here talking to them um, because they were the reason that I kind of got help in the first place because I didn't want them growing up having so many unanswered questions about why their daddy did what he did that's um, uh, oh. yeah 
that's a massive thing, mate. Sorry, that's uh, quite that's a big that. thing to. I don't know. I suppose process. You don't because obviously, from me looking at you as you played, you always played with that enthusiasm and things like that. And obviously, you're talking about this mask, and you know, you hear about these things. You watch the ITV stuff. I watched all the ITV stuff that you've done, and all the other bits that you've done, and obviously agreed to come on board to help you a little bit with this kind of uh, media side of things as well. And you, you don't realise how much something can affect someone until you're right in front of them which is yeah which is a big deal like and i think it resonates with me more that i've been there as well and it's 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 difficult to shake your head around it and i'm very glad that i'm here now and even amongst everything like this you wouldn't change it for the world because you're, st you're still living you're still breathing you've still got people around you yeah. that you love and care you for you you have you develop a, a kind of uh, an approach oh listen Oh. Yeah, no, we're here, mate. It's all right. Keep on going. That's all right. Um, no, you learn you learn a lot about yourself when faced with adversity and faced with them lows uh, and them dark days where you're contemplating um, taking your own life. Um, and yeah, well, I've been at death's door, and it's not a nice place to be. And the, when when you your eyes are open, when you're oh almost like a spiritual awakening when you kind of go on that journey of self-discovery and rediscover what's important to you the world becomes a, a beautiful place you know what i mean um, yeah no I, yeah yeah i do understand what you mean it, completely it sounds spiritual but and i'm not a spiritual person it so. isn't it isn't though because you you take once you realize you've been somewhere you take even the i don't know i suppose the even most minuscule of things in important i suppose every day for you being a father i suppose every day your daughters achieve something new or something like that and they could talk about it with you over facetime or they achieve something with you whilst they're at yours it's something that i suppose even the most unemotional man can get emotional about yeah i think that you um you do learn to appreciate the little things so for me i appreciate Monday, Wednesday, Friday at half past four, I get to speak to my girls, you know, yeah. and that to other people might seem real petty or daft or, uh, or whatnot, or just waking up every morning. That's a big one for me yeah. because I didn't want to wake up. I did not want to wake up at all. Um, I didn't want to get out of bed. Um, and like I said to you before, if it weren't for my children, I would have quite happy drove off a bridge into traffic whatever it was yeah yeah I'll, I'll, you know what i mean yeah so that course. appreciation just waking up in the morning yeah and and having that first that, that waking up turning over rolling over and seeing your missus or your children yeah. or whatever yeah absolutely you you appreciate it and like I, my my head's a busy place so this this covid19 and being isolated and uh, and shut away from the world it it can kind of get to me but i'm appreciating time with my partner her children uh, when i get to see my children um, on the 9th of april it just like little things that you and in today's society and given the situation money doesn't matter you just can't go out and spend it really no exactly uh, it gives you a lot more time to save at the moment doesn't it thinking yeah, about christmas maybe but already wear, but your wares are relevant um it is really down to you how you utilize your time and how you how you go about your day because nobody's at it. So society is a very judgmental place, and whether you're outside or going out on a night out, people will judge on what you wear, on what you say, on what you do, how much money you have, what car you're driving, blah blah blah. And this breaks it down to the very basics and slows us all down. So. It's not about anyone else now. Yeah. It's not about um, anything other than how are you utilising your time to yeah. make yourself feel good. Yeah, so absolutely. For me, I'll try and spend my time with my partner, her children. As I said, my children, when I can get out in the garden, go for a run, walk the dog. But I want to spend my time also spreading positivity by doing videos, doing things like this and... Um, through the power of social media because it can be used for such a negative and I want to try and influence other people for a positive reason as opposed to 
reading, flicking through Facebook, everything doom and gloom, we're all going to be on lockdown, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like, what can we do about it? We can't. I, th- I, I think it's one thing that, not to get political in this at all, but I think actually the government have dealt quite well with it so far. It, it's it's been one of those things that you probably it was a bit, it was going to happen eventually, and they were just deciding when it was going to happen. And um, I think keeping us safe as a society is the best thing that we can hope for. Yeah, and I think that um, we we're just touching on that quickly. Yeah? I think that given the situation that we're facing. They have done a very good job, but it's almost it's almost passed the reins over to us as a society, us as a country, to step up and yeah. play our part. Well, it's, it, yeah, we can't, and it goes back to that control, doesn't it? Because we don't we don't have any control over anything outside our little bubble, because we all live in our own little bubbles, and we all go about our days, and we're all worried about what we're going to have for tea tonight, and what we're going to do this that, and the other and it's kind of forced us to kind of look out for each other yeah and realize the verity of what actions and what what implications our actions have because no matter what you do whether your actions are positive or negative they will always have a consequence yeah you know? and people are dying still to this like now as we speak and uh, the numbers are growing and only we are the solution. We are the, the the solution to whether their numbers are in the thousands or whether they remain in the hundred. Yeah, you know? absolutely. In terms of deaths, you're absolutely right about that. Um, it's yeah, it's quite a scary thing. All of it. Um, if we're just going on to kind of uh, so you talk about managing uh, your kind of daily life at the moment. Talk about um, spreading positivity. Um, what would you? What did you hope when you first set up the charity? What was there an initial goal? Was there a initial reach that you wanted to put out to, or was it kind of just start it up and see how it goes? No. So I, the, the, with when you set up a business or when you set up something up, uh, you always have to kind of set yourself goals, set yourself targets. Where do you see yourself? Where do you want this to go? Um, so when I first set this up, it was, uh, my mind, it was, I want WAND to be in every major city across the UK. Okay, I want this to be a name that people think, oh yeah, mental health. They help people with their mental health. You know? Yeah. And by, by doing it as a business, it was a franchisable thing for me. So WAND is a platform for people to have a voice. Because you see in the papers, in the social media, in news, whatever it is, you see celebrities all the time talking about their mental health, about their addictions. And I just think that there's so many people with a story without a voice. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. One is that platform. We're giving people platforms. So we're building now. So we have uh, Shanice, uh, Sunice, sorry, who, who is a team manager for... Um, young and vulnerable women that may go through domestic abuse or a troubled time, young pregnancies, whatever it is, single parent at a young age or whatever, it, uh, bereavement, whatever it is. Uh, Sunice is kind of leading the way on that. Um, we're going to have people coming on board for anti-bullying. So we're going to have a team leader speci- specifically for anti-bullying. We're going to have a team leader that's coming on board that... Um, is going to be dealing with uh, PTSD sufferers um, and obviously myself. So we're kind of broadening it out now. So we're kind of specifically trying to reach different types of people. Yeah. So for me, when I go and do my talk, there might be 70 people in there. Not everybody is going to think, oh, that relates to me. Yeah. So by broadening my team um, and having people that are... Um, more specifically trained in their chosen area, um, I think we'll reach more people and more people will be like, actually, WAND, yeah, they have people who I can relate to. Because when you go to speak to a psychologist or a counsellor or whatever it is, you 
for me, I didn't feel like they understood me as a person or understood what I was going through because they'd never gone through it. Yeah. So the reason that I set this up is because I want to give people that realisation that we've gone through it, so we understand what you're going through. Yeah. You know, we've lived it, we've come there, come through it, we've been there and done it. So nothing that you will say will surprise me because I've probably done it tenfold. Yeah. You know? We've walked to the top so of the hill, been been... chucked off and walked back up it kind of thing. Yeah. So when somebody comes to me and says... Oh, I'm really struggling because of this, this, this. I got, I understand because I felt the exact same way when I was drinking every morning and, you know, etc. So, you don't need to read a book, okay, to help people. All you need is a little bit of life experience and yeah. time because that's what we have. We have the time to listen. We have the time to come and see you. We have the time to do this, speak to people and... And that's really how this will grow is by people thinking, you know what, we're going to actually listen because they might know what they're on about. Um, You've got more, so more time than ever now as well when you think about exactly. it really. Next and two and, and a bit weeks. Dunis coming on board and like I say, us building that team, we'll be able to reach further and to more people as opposed to just me doing it. Absolutely. So... Um... So you've done certain bits of press, you've done kind of BBC, local BBC radio, you've done ITV, Angular, various bits like that. Uh, there are also a couple of bits in the pipeline that we've spoken about, which obviously yes. probably aren't best to speak about right now, just in case uh, they fall through. Um, but yeah. re- some really exciting stuff. And so from my perspective, it's fantastic to be on board. But from your perspective, what is the kind of going forward post COVID-19? Are there any big plans yeah, so like I say, you're kind of in the loop with um, a few things that we've got in the pipeline. Um, we're in talks at the minute um, with a potential partner to come on board, uh, a big name in the mental health world. Um, but fingers crossed that can um, kind of all go ahead. Um, and like I say, the, the big thing for me is building the right team um, because anything like this is going to take time. Remember, we started, I, I started this company in October last year, you know, so we're still very young. Um, and there's a likes of mind out there. There's so many people that are doing what we're doing. Um, and I just think that we're going to take our time with it because we don't want to rush it. We're here for people. We'll reach as many people as we can and slowly, but surely we will grow. And, um, we will get into different catchment areas. We will get to the places that we want to be. But it's like anything, it's a process. If you rush something, it's like recovery. If you rush your recovery, then you'll just fall back to where you started. Everything is a process. So what we try and um, what we're trying to build and what we try and reiterate to our clients is that every little step that you take is there for a purpose. Um, and it's the same with growing one. Every step we're taking is a purpose that is, is being put in place for a purpose. Uh, and if we try and rush or skip a step, then we're just going to fall fl- flat back to where we were. So um, there is a lot in the pipeline. Um, we, we've obviously had to put on hold um, a few things. Uh, we're still in contact with our clients and they're doing amazing. Um, through Skype and social media, etc., um, and they're on board with, um, with their treatment programs and stuff. So things are positive. We're remaining positive, and um, watch this space because um, there's big things coming. Awesome, Husey. Thank you very much, mate. We'll get all this uh, cleared up and onto YouTube as soon as possible, mate. Thank you very much. My pleasure, mate. You look after yourself. And you, mate. Take care. Take care, mate. Bye bye.